Hi, and welcome to the Clayton Eats Generative AI podcast mini series. Uh, we'll, we'll have a range of experts from different subject areas to cover this topic in detail. We know there's a lot of discussion around this topic, so rather than covering it in generalities, we'll actually do a series of deep dives so you get some practical takeaways. I'm your host, Will Howe. I lead Clayton Newtz's data analytics capability. Uh, and today I'm joined by my guest, Simon Newcomb. Uh, Simon is a lead intellectual property and technology lawyer in the firm, and he also serves in a number of leadership roles here in the firm, including on our cyber leadership board. Um, he's also a computer scientist by training. Uh, so this is not just theoretical for Simon. He actually knows what's going on in the machine as well as what's going on inside the law. So in this session, we'll cover three main areas. We'll cover um, ownership of what actually comes out of this technology. We'll also cover infringement potential. And we'll also cover where we are today with the law and where this is all headed. So um, Simon, a lot of things going on, but can we start with why are we here? What's changed? Right. Um, well, certainly there was a lot of, um, of interest in some of the new um, generative AI technologies that, that came out last year, um, like um, Stable Diffusion, DALI2, the, the sort of image generators. And uh, a lot of people thought they were really cool, uh, really interesting. Uh, and for some people, it was right at the heart of their you know, personal and professional lives. But for a lot of people, it was more just kind of interesting or cool. Now, um, over the Christmas holidays, uh, you know, sort of end of November um, and then over, over Christmas, something really big happened and that was the release of ChatGPT. Uh, and that has brought generative AI really out into the public for written works. And the thing is, everybody writes. Uh, and so I think it sort of ignited uh, interest on a much bigger scale uh, because everyone can see how this affects them in terms of their personal and professional lives. And so that's sort of sparked a massive amount of interest uh, in this topic. Well, and that's a good point. And so we're now actually using this to create a huge amount of new content. Uh, and, and some of that's great, some of it's not. But, you know, eventually, if not already, some of that content is going to become very important parts of our personal and work lives. Um, can you touch on who actually owns this stuff? So let's start with the position uh, in Australia because it is different in different countries. So the answer to that is generally no, uh, you can't own the, the output of generative AI. Um, so copyright is the main type of IP right that usually protects this type of content. So I'm talking about text or art, uh, you know, images, music or films. Um, but the thing is that our Copyright Act requires that there's a human author to qualify for copyright. So where a work is created you know, by generative AI without a human author, then there's most likely no copyright. Now, um, computer generated works have been denied this, you know, by our court. So it's not like this is the first time we've ever thought about this stuff. Uh, it has actually been before the courts. Some years ago, Telstra uh, tried to protect its phone directories, the yellow pages and the white pages uh, by copyright. And it went to court over that. And the court said, well, uh, there wasn't copyright. There was not copyright because there wasn't sufficient independent intellectual effort, uh, you know, of a literary nature by uh, exercised by human human author, that what had happened is the software essentially output the, the work that Telstra was kind of copyright in, so it wasn't able to enforce that. Um, another case of ACOS and UCorp involved um, some safety data sheets for hazardous materials. And again, similar kind of idea that the computer generated web pages, so it generated some HTML code, uh, and, and that was then formatted into these safety data sheets. Now, um, they tried, the company that did that tried to claim copyright in that, or they did claim copyright in that, uh, and, and that was rejected by the court because the court said, no, there wasn't a human author that the computer had produced this. So it's, it's fairly clear uh, at the moment that under our Copyright Act that there's not going to be um, copyright for purely you know, AI generated works. I mean, that seems pretty cut and dry, uh, but there is an element to me where it seems this whole thing about the prompt. And actually when a human being is working with this, you know, you get, you know, dramatically different results depending on what prompt you put in. So does that prompt potentially give you an element where there is a human author? <laughs> 
So um, the, the whole notion of prompt engineering is is now a thing. Uh, it's a phenomenon in itself. So there are prompt engineers and prompt databases uh, where um, you know people uh, store the um, the best prompts. Um, so uh, those prompts, the text that you give to the AI, uh, you know, in most cases, except for the most simple of prompts, will be small literary works themselves and they'll be protected by copyright. Um, so the prompts themselves are protected, but that doesn't mean that, um, that that then protects the output. Because the thing with copyright is that it protects the expression rather than the idea. So giving an idea to an AI is not enough. The human actually needs to be part of the actual creation of the work. Um, not merely the idea that the AI responds to. So it, look, it's possible that you could have um, enough uh, detailed human instruction uh, in a prompt, so it was so specific uh, about how to generate the output that that creates enough human creativity for it to qualify for copyright. And, and in that case, you, you know, you'd have to think of the AI essentially more like a tool or an extension of the human author rather than generating the work itself. Okay. And is that just how we view it here in Australia or, or what's going on in some of the other countries around this particular topic? Right. Uh, so there's some very different positions in other countries. Uh, and, and so some countries like the UK and New Zealand uh, expressly recognise uh, computer generated works uh, in their legislation. So um, so what they say is they get around this issue about um, there being no human author by by saying that the author is is actually taken to be the person who undertakes the arrangements necessary for the creation of the work. Um, now, in a generative AI context, that potentially has some ambiguity as to how you apply that. Is it the programmer? Uh, is it the person who trained the AI? Um, or is it the uh, the end user who then prompts the AI? Um, and I, so I think there's, you know, there's more um, interpretation is going to be needed um, to understand quite how that works in the context of generative AI. Uh, in, the, in the context of, say, a video game, uh, there was a case in the UK where uh, where it was held that the the graphics generated by the video game uh, were owned by the programmer. Um, there are some, also some similar laws to that in other countries. It's not just those two. So there's kind of a group, if you like, that that recognise that computer generated work. Yeah. And so that's the UK jurisdiction. What about the US? So the US um, has a somewhat similar um, position to us, I guess, in that in the US, it, there is a requirement for a human author. And so uh, generally speaking, there, there would be no copyright in the US, uh, on my understanding uh, of US law. And, and uh, having said that, there is a very recent case um, that's been filed uh, just on the 10th of January, uh, where this is being challenged. So, um, so a, a person called Dr. Stephen Thaler um, is suing the US Copyright Office, claiming that um, he um, uh, he created a, um, a generative AI called the Creativity Engine that created a quite beautiful image called a, a recent entrance to paradise. And he argues that the AI was actually the author of the copyright and that he's the owner um, of that under the work for hire doctrine because the AI was working for him. Um, this, to my knowledge, is the first case of its kind. Um, Dr. Dr. Thalia, Thalia was um, is rather a um, uh, a pioneer of um, of lit litigation um, over the status of AI um, in in regards to intellectual property. Uh, so it may be that part of his objective in running this case is is to draw attention to this issue, um, as he is in some other fields, um, which we might talk about a bit later. So I think for now, um, the legal principle here is that AI is not recognised as a legal person. Uh, it can't be sued. It doesn't have legal rights. Uh, it can't own property, uh, including intellectual property. Hmm. Okay, so we've we've covered copyright there, and I think you've covered some really good perspectives of where we are here in Australia and around the world. Um, can we move to patents potentially? So what if the... AI comes up with something that is truly inventive. Uh, can you get a patent for that? <laughs> 
So, um, so in Australia, the position is pretty similar to copyright, and the, and the answer is pretty clearly no. Uh, where where it's something that is invented by um, an AI, that's not going to work under our law because you need to have a natural person as the inventor, a human. Um, and again, I mentioned um, Dr. Dr. Stephen Thaler. Um, he um, he also uh, tried to register two patents in Australia, and uh, he, one was for a food container with this kind of um, fractal shape. Another one was for a light beacon. Um, both of which he said were invented by his uh, his generative AI, um, a system that he called Davis. Now, um, pretty amazingly, in a world first. Uh, he actually won uh, at first instance in, in the court and convinced the, the court that the AI was the inventor of the patent, uh, which, which did require, um, you know, some stretching, I guess, of, of the reading of, of our patents law. Now, that was appealed and overturned on appeal. Uh, then they tried again to go up to the High Court, um, who refused to hear the case. So now that's pretty final. Um, it's pretty clear in Australia, no patents for inventions uh, by generative AI. AI on our current law. Now, interestingly, Dr. Thaler is running that same case around the world. And as I understand it, he's had his application rejected in 18 jurisdictions, uh, including the US and the UK. And he's continuing to litigate some near identical cases to the one that he ran in Australia. So some of those cases are uh, uh, still going. I think the UK case on appeal to the Supreme Court is due to be heard in March this year. So people will be watching that pretty closely. Well, well, that also seems to be fairly straightforward then. And it is nice that in these few areas, there is some certainty in the law from what we have. Um, can, can we maybe move into a place that there, I think there's a bit more uncertainty, which is on the infringement side. So one of the big issues is as we're playing with this and the, the industry is playing with this and the world really is playing with this technology is a lot of people are asking themselves is, is this legal, right? Are we going to get sued for this? Um, so what's happening in the infringement space? Right. Well, I think it is a big issue. Um, and I think it helps uh, to consider when the main um, acts of copying happen here. Uh, and, in, you know, in a very broad sense, you can say, well, let's look at this firstly on training a model and secondly, then on using the model to generate content. Um, so firstly, on the training side, um, models are, are created um, by being trained. And what the way that works is that they um, they're given some data um, as an input and then trained to learn what is the desirable output for that particular input. And that's that's over huge cycles of that. They learn then um, how to train their neural nets, which are much like our brains, uh, full of you know, neurons and synapses, connections, essentially. Uh, and that that's how. Um, they are able to deal with many different situations that they have never seen before. Uh, so that process of training uh, involves huge amounts of data. So for a large language model like ChatGPT, uh, it uses a, a many, many terabytes of data called a corpus uh, to, to train up the model. Now, from what we know, uh, GPT-3, which sits under chat GPT, was trained on the common internet. So that's, you know, lots of websites scraped from the internet, um, user-generated content like Reddit, which, uh, you know, has the advantage of being upvoted and downvoted, um, Wikipedia, uh, and also uh, some books and journals. Now, the problem is that in all of that content, there's a lot of material there that's being created by people who own copyright in it. Uh, and it's subject to all sorts of different terms uh, that may or may not allow um, the, the use in this way. And in fact, some of them may expressly prohibit it. So the question here is, does the AI company have the right to copy that information or that material for training the model? So I think that touches on training. You also mentioned on the generation side, there's some potential liability issues for infringement there. What's happening in the generation space? Right. So so once you've got the model, then uh, use the model uh, to generate content. And and so um, it's sort of this is tricky because um, once the model's trained, it doesn't then uh, actually directly incorporate the training corpus, uh, that's just used for training the model. So uh, individual copyright works are not at least discreetly stored uh, in, in the model. 
Um, uh, but it is it, it's it's like it's stored in our brain in the in the sense of neurons um, and synapses connecting things. So big kind of massive association of of maths. Um, and so when you go to create content, a lot of the time that's not going to matter because you're creating new content. You're generating something that's different to anything that's been around before, and there's no issue of of copyright infringement there. But um, Large language models and other generative AI can actually recall uh, material that they've been trained on, you know, or close to it. Uh, so you try asking ChatGPT for song lyrics, and it will be able to tell you uh, a lot of the song lyrics. It can tell you the chorus, and and it can probably tell you most of the song. Um, what I found is that towards the end of the song, often it starts to make up new verses, and that's pretty fun. Um, but you know, but it's close enough to the original original song um, that you know that if you were doing that side by side, probably would be uh, you know an infringement. But the fact it's gone through this model really complicates the copyright analysis. That's really fascinating. So is anyone actually suing these companies right now, these generative AI companies? Um, so this is a very recent development. And yes, there are. There's uh, there's three pretty significant actions that have just recently started. Um, so the first one is a class action against Microsoft, the, the owner of GitHub, uh, which you would know as a very large repository of source code. Um, and its business partner, OpenAI, um, that's responsible for ChatGPT. And you know that ChatGPT is not only great at writing uh, literary, you know, text, human readable text. It's also great at um, at writing software code, uh, also human readable, but uh, for a different purpose. So. Um, what has happened is that they've trained um, ChatGPT up on huge amounts of code um, taken from GitHub, and the developers are claiming um, that there's been an, an infringement there, or at least a violation of rights management information um, by doing that. And this is an interesting area um, because I know, Simon, you're also a computer scientist. How would you feel if your code was then sucked up into one of these tools? Right. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I think I think that most people who put their code on GitHub um, generally do it um, as part of a community um, where they're kind of uh, well intentioned to develop the science and art of you know so many things. And so I I I would probably be okay with that if I was releasing my code uh, on GitHub. I think. You know, it's generally, that's my view anyway, I think a fairly kind of open um, platform. Mm. Interesting. But then when it does spit it out verbatim, that's the interesting point about attribution, isn't it? Right. And so right. people are saying, well, at least acknowledge that it's my code. Well, that's that's it, that a lot of the licenses would require that and that hasn't happened. So that's really actually the basis of of the um, the litigation here is that that the the um, developers aren't being attributed um, and the licenses are so permissive anyway, like the MIT open source license allows you to do just about anything. And so I think that's probably why the case isn't claiming straight out copyright infringement. And in a lot of cases, it probably is actually licensed for this purpose. Now, whether anyone actually thought of that when they were putting their code up there is another issue. But uh, the attribution uh, point is probably more the key point in that case. Um, and so that's, that's on the GitHub side. What about this sort of image generation side? Right. Uh, so there's another case that's been brought by three visual artists against uh, Stability AI, the maker of Stable Diffusion, uh, Mid Journey, and Deviant Art, and they're all um, generative AI image tools. And the the artists are basically alleging that the the defendants have used their work uh, by sucking up huge uh, numbers of images, uh, including their work, uh, to train their their models. Uh, and they've done that without permission. Uh, and they're, they're doing it to generate new and in some cases infringing works. And one of their main concerns is that uh, the these tools allow people to create images in the style of a particular artist. And they see that as potentially damaging to their livelihoods or their reputation. 
uh, where it's possible now potentially to create art, and I bet the music industry, is, well, as I understand it, is very concerned about this, uh, where you could just say generate music in the style of a particular artist right, rather than waiting till the next album comes out. Now, que different question about whether you think that's any good or not, but uh, that none, you know certainly would be a concern. And, and I think, so we were talking about GitHub, we were talking about um, Stability AI. Uh, there's another case on the go you were telling me about as well, right, Simon? This one's actually in the UK. So Getty Images, just very, very recently on the 17th of January, um, has commenced uh, a case uh, against, again, Stability AI, one of the image generators, uh, basically saying that, um, that Stability AI has used a huge number of, of Getty's images um, without the right to do so. And in fact, Getty even says, hey, we've actually even got a license available, a type of license for training AIs, and you guys haven't used that. Um, so they're alleging uh, infringement in creating this, uh, this stable diffusion product. Yeah, I understand. And obviously, the creators involved in this process then understandably are not happy with some of this and though so are turning to the courts for remedy. So how are these cases going to play out? And, you know, what do you see being involved in the cases? So the U.S. cases are probably going to turn on uh, their doctrine of fair use. Um, which is a pretty broad exception that allows um, creating transformed works uh, that are, are really something new that, that don't have a, a lot of harm on the original source work. Uh, and you can see in, a, in the AI context that there's a, a real argument that that's what's happening here, that training up models on an existing corpus of data is creating something new and query whether, you know, what effect that has on the, the original work. Uh, this has been used by the, the tech companies uh, successfully previously. You might remember back in 2015, uh, Google imaged millions of books uh, to create um, full text searching of books, and it was able to use the fair use defense in, in that case. Uh, the UK cases, uh, uh, the UK case so far uh, will probably be different. They in the UK have an exception uh, in their legislation for text and data mining for non-commercial purposes. So that may be relevant to that Getty Images case. Query whether it's non-commercial, uh, but that may come into play in that in that case. And this kind of leads to uh, an interesting and very controversial practice that's emerging, um, and and where the the AI companies uh, have been funding uh, nonprofits or academic institutions, uh, you know, under the banner of research to create uh, and train the model. And it's being alleged essentially that they're doing that uh, to get within these copyright exceptions uh, that enable the model to be trained without infringing copyright. And then the suggestion is that once that's done, then the AI company can take the model and commercialize it. And that practice is being called data laundering. Uh, it's untested at the moment, uh, but um, you know there's a lot of controversy around whether it's actually effective uh, to avoid copyright infringement. Mm -hmm. it, it feels like there's a lot of nuance in here um, in terms of these defenses. Now, you talked about this is happening in the US and the UK. Do we have anything like this in Australia here? Well, no, we don't. Not directly. Uh, we don't have a fair use uh, or tax and data mining exception in Australia. What we have is a thing called fair dealing. And our law um, allows fair dealings in quite specific and narrower uh, situations. And one of them, probably the most relevant one, is fair dealing for the purposes of research or study. Uh, now, that could possibly apply to uh, allow training of a model. Uh, to my knowledge, it hasn't been tested whether uh, this type of activity would qualify as research as opposed to, you know, more of a, a factual inquiry into a subject, uh, whether training an AI in a, in a broad way like this would would uh, qualifies research. Uh, it also has to be fair. Uh, and now that looks at things like the nature and the purpose of the dealing, you know, is it commercial or non-commercial, and the effect that it has on the original work. So in some senses, even though it's in under a different law, uh, some of the big issues that are being considered in those US cases, I think, will be relevant to consider uh, in the Australian context where similar issues are relevant. Now, what that might mean in Australia, if we have a narrower law here, that it puts greater emphasis on getting licenses or using content which is in the public domain if you want to go training 
generative AI models. Well, so that that point there about if you are generating and creating and training these models, that sounds really important if you are based in Australia, which obviously we are. Um, but does that apply? Like, are we going to be training any of these models here in Australia, do you think? Right. Well, look, I think we will. Um, so probably the first thing to say is that training large language models, as I understand it, is extremely expensive and capital intensive in terms of, uh, you know, computing capacity uh, and having huge amount, you know, numbers of human trainers and so on. So the, the industry um, will probably end up with a small number of very large companies like Microsoft, uh, OpenAI, Google, Meta, possibly a small number of others, including nation states. Uh, China has one, I understand, um, that will um, you know, will have these kind of very large language models. Now, it doesn't stop there, though, because uh, you can um, build on top of them. So large language models like chat like GPT allow you to create a new specific layer on top of the general model, which provides better knowledge or accuracy on a particular topic. And that's called fine tuning the model. Um, so that's going to allow all sorts of organizations to do all sorts of things. So to build more specialized AI, um, and, and but also transfer all the existing uh, natural language capability uh, up through into their specialized models. So say you're a, a government department or a bank and you want to produce a chatbot for your customers that's really easy to talk to, like ChatGPT, but it also knows a lot more about your specific products or services and your regulatory environment. So rather than create your, your own large language model from scratch, which is going to be prohibitively expensive, you could fine tune an existing model. So I, I think in Australia and you know globally, we'll see a lot of that over time, both by you know organisations for themselves and product and service providers with niche offerings uh, to to make available to them. And that activity is going to involve the same issues in training a model, uh, and it brings in all the IP rights issues that we were, we've been talking about. So from what we've discussed already, Simon, uh, it's clear that there is some challenges with respect to copyright and patent law with how it applies to this here in Australia. Now, uh, this to me feels like technology disruption in some other spaces. And I know, for example, in the mobility space, uh, you know, notably, there's been a lot of disruption over the last 10 years. And, and this is one area where it feels like organizations moved a little bit ahead of the law and, you know, consequences then flowed afterwards. And for this do you see any sort of changes or or moves to change the law here in Australia to actually catch up with this? I think that that is a good observation. I think that this this does feel similar in that there's some disruption here where the companies are moving ahead of the law and potentially that will create consumer uh, demand where we all get used to doing things in a particular way and and the law then needs to catch up to you know to allow society to operate in a in an ordered way that you know that deals with this new disrupted disruptive technology. So you know of the of the things that we've talked about today on the IP issues, uh, I think there's uh, absolutely potential for law reform. So on the ownership of AI-generated works, actually, this was considered nearly 30 years ago by the Copyright uh, Law Review Committee back in 1995, uh, who recommended that we give copyright protection to computer-generated works in Australia. Uh, that didn't go anywhere at the time, uh, but I think it's a good time to be having that debate again, as the stakes are really going up considerably now with generative AI. Uh, more recently, the World Intellectual Property Organization has been asking its members some pretty deep philosophical questions about uh, should we, you know, should we have this type of protection for AI-generated works? And you know, frankly, there are good arguments for and against. Uh, it's not an easy call. So advocates say it'll drive greater investment and innovation into the space because it gives commercial incentive. Uh, opponents say mass-produced works generated by AI could devalue works, uh, you know, devalue the humanity in a way. Um, um, but by flooding it, I suppose, with um, with uh, AI generated works, um, and and really, I suppose, reduce the the reward that humans get for artistic expression and talent. Um, now, um, Australia so far has been pretty non-committal to that, so uh, you know, I think more debate is really needed on that that point. Now, on the on the sort of training and infringement front, again, yes, there's been um, there's been some debate around that, 
And uh, I, mean, I suppose firstly, we can look at overseas for guidance on what we might do. So the US has that fair use uh, exception. The UK, which is quite pro AI, uh, has those um, text and data mining laws. And they're, they're actually looking at the moment about whether it'd be a good idea to change their law so that it's not limited to non-commercial purposes, that it can go further. Uh, so, uh, you know, Australia has actually looked at both those options and in 2013, the Australian Law Reform Commission released a report that said, well, if we don't have this fair use exception, either we should have that maybe, or, or if not, then we should uh, have a new exception that allows um, these types of uses like data and text mining. Again, that didn't go anywhere at the time. So again, I think it's time to be re-engaging uh, re in this debate. Yeah. Uh, lots of interesting things to be thinking about in our policymaking community, um, I suspect. It's interesting your point about 1995, and obviously, you know, hindsight's 2020. I was also just reflecting on the state of computing during that time, and I think that was when uh, there was the famous speech about no, no computer will need more than 640 kilobytes of RAM. And right. so, <laughs> obviously, obviously, these big models are trained with millions of GPUs. Each one of them would have gigabytes of, of VRAM in them. And so, uh, a very different age that, uh, although it was prescient, uh, was not exactly foreseen. So, um, lots, lots of interesting things about the future. And so, I guess one of those is a lot of companies are getting into this now and trying to look into the crystal ball a little bit and, and see the future. And so. What advice would you give to firms that are starting to get into this generative AI journey? Uh, well, I've put together um, a, a list of top 10 points um, to uh, to manage the IP issues in, around generative AI. Um, uh, so um, I can kind of uh, group those, I suppose. The first group is like, what are the things that you really need to do straight away if you're thinking about starting to use gen, uh, generative AI? So one immediate thing to do, point one, is to tell your staff not to put confidential information into chat GPT because it's not confidential. It's in research mode uh, and it's not confidential. So we've sent an email to all of our staff to say, don't put confidential information into it when you're experimenting with it. Uh, point two is really try to get your head around the basic principles of how IP works in a generative AI context. Uh, and you might need to do that in, in more than one jurisdiction uh, where you operate. We've talked about copyright and patents and there look, there are also um, some particular issues for other types of IP. So if you're using uh, ChatGPT to help you brainstorm ideas for trademarks, uh, there are some issues there, or you're wanting to protect confidential information, uh, you know, some additional issues there. Uh, point uh, three is that if you really need to own copyright uh, or patent uh, that's in something, then it's probably a good idea not to use generative AI for the time being. And, you know, an example might be a software company. Uh, if, if it's critical that you own the copyright in your source code, uh, maybe using generative AI is going to create some issues for you over time on a big scale uh, around questions of, of do you actually own the copyright in your software? Uh, and you, if that's important, then uh, you might also want to uh, flow that down into your service contracts uh, to prohibit that in outsourced developments. Now, that's obviously going to involve a trade-off between cost efficiency and the benefit of IP ownership. Point four is make sure that you don't falsely claim that you own copyright uh, in AI-generated content when it doesn't exist. So in some cases, that could expose you to a claim for unjustified threats or a breach of warranty in a contract, misleading conduct, or even fraud. Uh, point five is understand the risks of infringing third-party AI when, sorry, IP when using generative AI. Uh, so that's probably something that you would do in the context of your specific um, application uh, and look at how the risks are mitigated or transferred. Now, some of the tools are already starting to try to manage this. So with Copilot, um, it will actually, before it generates the content for you, it will now go and search GitHub to see if it's a close match to something that's already there. Um, some of the image generators are, are doing something similar. Uh, point uh, six is understand the um, the terms of service of the generated AI and whether they work for you. 
So that can be quite different. For example, ChatGPT says that it assigns IP to the um, the user. Stable Diffusion says that the user abandons IP and dedicates it to the public domain. So you know, in Australia, maybe that's not such a big issue when there isn't uh, likely to be IP, uh, but it, it, in other jurisdictions, it would be. Uh, point seven is think about whether you want to stop AI companies training their models on your content uh, and set up appropriate terms on your website or how you make the data available uh, and also look at the technology measures that you, um, you use to stop uh, and regulate access. And some of the, uh, the AI companies are also creating uh, pathways to uh, for content creators to ask for their content to be removed or, or not used in training. Uh, now, I suppose the next kind of group of issues is, is for new businesses. So um, point eight, if you're thinking about building um, a fine-tuned model on top of ChatGPT, then really you should have a pretty clear strategy to clear the rights and use the training data um, and also to protect the resulting model that comes out of that training. There's going to be lots of opportunities for uh, for business and government to reuse data that they have. Uh, so, for example, we've just done an agreement for um, a government department to to license copyright in X-rays to CSIRO uh, to create software that um, helps in diagnosing a particular type of lung disease. Um, so, you know, that's going to require a, an agreement in that case, and we'll see licenses and R&D agreements and so on entered for that sort of thing. Point nine, um, if you're looking to invest in an AI business, then I think you kind of need to understand how these issues impact on the valuation of that business. So what IP um, will be created? Um, how is it protected? Uh, and is there a risk of infringement against that business that might devalue it? Um, and, and also understanding the limitations, I guess, of Australian copyright law in owning databases. And that's fundamentally what a trained model is. Uh, and, and the law is that generally databases uh, that are just a result of, of computer generation are, are not subject to copyright. So more likely the strategy would be that they be protected by confidential information. Last point, point 10, is that there are lots of other issues other than IP uh, to manage in addition to the IP issue. So liability and reliance um, around inaccurate content, uh, privacy for data ingested into the model, uh, compliance, procurement and contracting issues. So as you said at the start, we're planning uh, some further videos on this, uh, bringing in other experts to talk about some of these issues. So. Uh, lots of other things to think about in addition to IP. Simon, thank you. Uh, that was fantastic. Really appreciate you sharing your insights. I know actually on our journey here at Clayton News, we're building solutions with this as well. And your insights have been really important for us to actually work through some of these issues um, as we go. So thank you for that. And to the listeners, thank you for joining us today. As Simon mentioned, we've got a lot of great new content and, and extra experts that'll come in and share different specific angles. So we see you on the next one.